Good morning. I'm Beck, and I'm going to be leading us in God's Word this morning. If you need a Bible, there are some in your pews. The first reading this morning comes from the book of Haggai, chapter 1, and it's found on page 769 in the purple colored book Bibles. A call to build the house of the Lord. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shiltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your full. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages, only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of the heavens, because the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops, I called a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produces, on people and livestock and on all the labor of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai because the Lord their God had sent him and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Josedak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of, of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month. The second reading this morning is from the book of Philippians, chapter 1, verses 20 to 26, and that's found on page 951. Philippians chapter 1, verse 20. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Thank you, Beck. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Joel. Uh, again, big welcome to Hugh and George here and all our, any other visitors we have. I'm a student minister here at Wente. Big welcome to you. And today we're beginning a, a series in the Old Testament book of Haggai, um, which is an exchange between God through the prophet Haggai to his people who are disillusioned and disappointed. They're, God's speaking to his people in a time when his people have had great expectations for Blessing and glory crushed. His people are facing struggle. And instead of prosperity, they've had poverty. And instead of opulence, they've had oppression. God's people have been struggling. And yet the message that God gives to his people in this time to his disillusioned people is no matter what the circumstances are, 
no matter what's going on in your life, I'm there with you in it and I'll get you through it. If you remain faithful to me, I'll ensure that you'll have true blessings. I'll get you through whatever suffering and hardship that you face. I am with you, says the Lord. This is the message of Haggai in a nutshell. And it's the message that we desperately need to hear as well as people who face hardships and trials. And so for the next three weeks, we're going to reflect on Haggai's message of hope and power and potential in a context of frustration, weakness, and setbacks. We're going to be reflecting on God's message that he is with us even through hardships and trials. Now, the thing about hardships and trials is that they often trigger um, one of our most basic human instincts. One of the most basic human instincts, psychological instincts, is self-preservation. This is the instinct within us when we're facing danger or pain or the fear of these things to run away, to, to do whatever we can to protect ourselves, protect the body part, to um, escape danger, fight or flight, those kind of responses. Then one of the most basic human instincts is self-preservation, and it's a universal instinct. Even the most simplest life forms like bacteria have a self-preservation instinct. I don't know what that looks like for them, but um, <laughs> it seems to work. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's a universal instinct, and it's a good thing. You know, God has given us this instinct because he's given us life, and life is good, and life wants to stay alive. And so when you're being attacked by a lion, you want to do whatever you can to um, get out of the lion's grip and escape and go to safety. Self-preservation is good. But the problem is that actually often our self-preservation instinct misfires. And often as human beings, because of something that's off in our heart, because of human sin, our self-preservation instinct, instead of leading us to the place of true safety, it can actually lead us away. See, the problem that we face is when hardship and suffering comes is that we um, are, are tempted to, instead of running towards God into his safe embrace, we actually attempted to run away from him and take things into our own hands, to put ourselves first and not put God in his rightful place. So today in God's Word, we're going to be challenged with the problem of self-preservation and how in Haggai chapter 1, we're going to see that contrary to the basic instincts that we all have, it actually is more safe, more life-preserving for us, eternally safe, eternally life-preserving for us to not trust our self-preservation instinct and look after ourselves, but to turn to God and give ourselves into his hands and into his care. So what we're going to be thinking about today. Um, I need a clicker. Gary, do you have the clicker on you? David, thank you. So, I, yeah, David's always trying to set me up like that. Um, <laughs> but thank you. So that's what we're going to see in our sermon series. Haggai, I am with you. And today, the main idea we're going to be thinking about is it is always the right time to put God front and center. No matter what the circumstances, no matter what the hardships you're facing or the suffering you're facing, it is never the right time to put yourself first. It is always the right time to put God first, God front and center. So that's what we're going to be thinking about in Haggai chapter 1 today. Let me pray for us again as we begin. Father, I just pray that you would please open our hearts to your word, to what you want to say to us. Move amongst us powerfully by your spirit and bring us um, a sight into your glory, your goodness, and to run to you, to give us the strength to put you first no matter what. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're um, going to be going through Haggai chapter 1 together. So if you open your Bibles there, and um, firstly, for a bit of context, I've got a timeline for how Haggai fits in. Hopefully you can kind of make some things out there. But um, what's happened about 70 years um, before the time of Haggai is the worst event ever in Old Testament history. If in 586 BC, um, after years of God's people rebelling against God, God finally sent uh, a final moment of judgment against his people. The Babylonian Empire came and destroyed Jerusalem, the city rampaged it and destroyed the temple of God and the people were exiled, deported into Babylonia. And this was a moment, this is a horrific moment, not just of the, the, the destruction done, but for God's people. It was a sign that they have been rejected by God. But God had not fully given up on them. God has a plan 
and he promised to rescue and restore a small group, a remnant of the people of Israel. And so he shaped the course of history. So 50 years later in 537 BC, the Persian empires conquered the Babylonians. And in 538 BC, God stirred King Cyrus, the Persian king, stirred his heart to allow the Jews to go back home to Judea. And he didn't just allow them to go, but he gave them permission to rebuild Jerusalem, rebuild the temple, and he gave them the resources to do this as well. It was remarkable. Things were looking up for God's people. This is going to be the time when things are finally set right. This is going to be the time when the God's people are going to finally experience the glory and blessings that they've been promised. But soon Cyrus died, and there's turmoil in the Persian Empire. And, and amongst all the political change over the, the rights that were given to the Jews and the permission was forgotten and the people in the land that they were um, coming back into were also trying to oppose them politically and threaten them with violence and the land itself seemed to not want them there. There was drought and famine. Things are hard. And so that's the context that we come into as we come to Haggai and we look at verse 1. And if you read verse 1 in Haggai, there's a date there, the second year of the king Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. And historians can calculate this date to the 29th of August, 520 BC. 18 years after the exiles had returned, and 18 years of disappointment and setbacks. 18 years later, God now has a message through the prophet Haggai to his jaded people, who are facing so much problems, so much setbacks. But the message that he brings to them doesn't address those problems first. It actually addresses a more serious problem. Take a look at verse 2 with me. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. See, God's pointing out a problem in the hearts of his people who are saying that because of the context we're in, because of the suffering, the hard times, it's not the right time to build God's temple. That's what God's house means, the temple of God. And this is really significant for the Old Testament people of God under the Old Covenant. The temple was the place where God dwelt amongst them. The temple was the heartbeat of their very relationship with, faith, with God. It was the heartbeat of their faith. It was how they, where they came to worship him, pray to him, offer sacrifices. And so that was why it's so devastating when the temple was destroyed and why it was so important that they rebuild the temple when they came back into the land. And so for God's people to say, now's not the time to build your house, they're basically saying to God, now's not the time to bother with you. We're too busy. We've got bigger things going on for us. Life is tough. We just need a moment for ourselves. We don't need to bother with any of this God stuff. We need to get our own lives sorted first. And you kind of think, well, it's, it's a bit reasonable, isn't it? That drought, famine, you know, um, low income, cost of living's high, opposition, threats of violence. But did you notice what God has to say about this in verse 3? Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai, is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says, give careful thought to your ways. See, he's asking them, how's it working out for you? Do you think it, this is really the time for you to put yourselves first above me? You know, do you think it's really time to put a roof over your own head while you neglect my house? Well, our, our natural responses go, yeah, of course it is. <laughs> We've got to put a roof over our own head before we can worry about um, anything else going on. Our natural instinct says, yes, it is okay that we put ourselves first above God, particularly in times of hardship and suffering. Let me ask us here, do you think it's ever okay to put yourself before God? Do you find yourself doing that? Even just for a little while for the sake of self-preservation? God says, no. No matter what your circumstances that you're facing, it's actually delusional to put yourself before God. Again, take a look at verse 5. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. How is it working out for you, putting yourselves first? All your efforts are frustrated. 
or you're eating and drinking, no satisfaction. All the money you're making, well, you just need more of it. It just goes into holes, pockets with holes in it. See, God is saying to his people that putting yourself first is not working out. It is never the answer. And that's what we need to hear as well. The Lord Jesus says that self-preservation is not the answer to everlasting preservation. In Luke chapter 9, he says, Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Do you see the paradox that Jesus is pointing out? That's so contradictory to our basic instinct. He's saying your instinct for self-preservation, if you want to save your own life, you're actually going to lose it for eternity if you put yourself first. But if you put aside your basic instinct for self-preservation and give yourself fully to God, that's actually the way you're going to truly preserve your life. You can gain the whole world, but you will lose and forfeit your very self. Now, I just want to say to us, we all go through suffering in life. Um, we, many of us here have been through what feels like more than your fair share of suffering. And uh, perhaps you're even going through that now. And I just want to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But I also want to say, don't make the mistake of using your suffering as an excuse to live for yourself. We see this happen don't we? Um, maybe we're friends or family. Maybe we, um, we see it in ourselves as well. Uh, perhaps it's the, the, the serious illness or the family crisis, and it's absolutely reasonable that this is going to disrupt life for a time, maybe even permanently. Things are going to be messed up. But we can often use those um, seasons of disruption as excuses to keep living for ourselves. Perhaps it's praying and reading the Bible. It's replaced by the therapy of Netflix and scrolling. Or the, the season where you might um, not be able to be as regular as at church is replaced by a regular pattern of skipping church whenever it's inconvenient for you. Or perhaps um, it's hard financial times that come. Well, when that happens, it's usually not the online shopping that gets the cut, is it? It's the giving. We, we, we stop being generous and we continue to look in, inward to ourselves. And even without any hardship, and we are preempting it. And so we store up money for ourselves and we're tight-fisted for those who are really in need. Or perhaps it's um, the career pressures. There's, there's big projects on. There's, there's stress at work. It's so easy in those moments to, to relieve the stress by relaxing a bit on holiness and indulging in a bit of sin, isn't it? See, we have this... Um, innate problem in ourselves because of, the, because of our human sin that we want to live for ourselves and our self-preservation basic instinct misfires at this point and we put ourselves first when actually it's totally wrong. We're under a delusion that putting ourselves first is what's really going to help us. We need a rea reality check. Come to verse 7 with me. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin while each of you is busy with your own house. Do you see what the Lord is saying to his people here? He's saying, in this time, even through all the hardship that you're facing, the answer wasn't to go build your own house. What I require of you is to go build my house, build my temple, so that I may take pleasure in it and be on it. Are you ready for a reality check? The ultimate reality check? All of life, your life, my life, your kid's life, your neighbor's life, the life of the people that you don't even know, all of life exist for the purpose that we would please and honor God. Wow. Now, I want to give us a brief history, science history lesson. Does anyone remember Nicholas Copernicus? Um, a scientist from the 16th century who literally changed the world. See, for thousands of years, people believed that um, the Earth was the center of the galaxy and everything revolved around the Earth. But in... 
1543, Copernicus discovered that this was wrong, that it's not the earth that's the center of the world, it's the sun. And everything else in our galaxy, including um, earth, revolves around the sun. This was a massive revolution in his time. Friends, we too need to have a Copernican revolution take place in our life. We need to have our worlds changed because we need to know that against our basic instinct and delusion, life doesn't revolve around us. It all exists for the pleasure and honour of God. See, God is the creator of all things. He created the whole universe by a very word out of nothing. And he created your life. He created um, your, your life. He created my life. He created every single thing that exists and he continues to sustain it by his very will and power. That breath you just took now, God has given that to you for the purpose that you may live to please and honour him. That's pretty confronting, isn't it? You're not first place. Not in your own life and certainly not in anyone else's life. There's no situation, no circumstances where it's okay for God to not absolutely reign supreme in your life. God is king. He's the creator. We're not. And not even our very basic needs come before this. Listen to Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 6. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? But seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Do you see the absolutely radical thing that Jesus is putting before us here, saying that your very, very basic instincts of self-preservation, the basic needs of life, don't come before God. Seek God's first, and everything else will follow. Here's the point. Putting God first before yourself is not only the key to our very existence, but is also the key to true and lasting safety, peace, protection, joy, happiness. It's all found in God. He's the one who made us, and he loves us, and he's the one who can truly care for us. No matter the circumstances you're facing, putting God first is the only answer. Now, this is big, mind-blowing stuff. This is worldview-shaping things. This is heart-changing realities. What does this look like? Well, I want to put it to us that this looks like putting God front and centre. See, the first one's pretty simple. Putting God front, it means God come first. He's our first priority. He's the value that we value above all other values. He's the one that we love above all our other loves. He's first on the list. All our other priorities come underneath him. Yet, it's not as simple as just a list. It also looks like centering your life upon God. All our life revolves around God. See, the problem with lists, they're too simplistic. Life doesn't really work with one, two, three, four, five, and so on. And it's not God against our other things, and it's not our other things in competition with each other. No, it's actually God shaping and determining all our other priorities in life. Think of it as God as the sun and all our other priorities are orbiting around him and have their position in relationship to him. See, this looks like living out our various roles and responsibilities and relationships in the way that honors God the most. For example, you can give yourself fully to ministry work, but if you do that while neglecting to love your family, well, that doesn't actually please and honor God, does it? But on the flip side, you can give yourself to something good like your family pour your life into your family and erect such boundaries that you neglect your other responsibilities of work and friends in the community, um, ministry, and, and your relationship with God himself. And that is definitely dishonoring and displeasing to the Lord. See, it's complicated, isn't it? We need a lot of wisdom to, to think through this and no one size fits all. For the Israel at the time of Haggai, it looked like building the temple. Now, in the new covenant, since the Lord Jesus has come, there is no temple. Jesus is our true temple. And so for us, we don't need to build a temple. And so for each one of us, it's different and requires wisdom and reflection on the Bible of how we are to live fully for his pleasure and honor in our circumstances and situations. 
in the relationship and the roles and responsibilities the Lord has given us. So the basic first question we've got to ask ourselves is, is the first priority in my life to please and honour God? And then the question from there is, how am I going to please and honour God in this situation? So we've got to put God front and centre. But to do that first, we need a Copernican revolution. We need a reality check. We need to awaken to the delusion that putting ourselves first is actually destructive and awaken to the beauty that God is the very centre of life. But we are faced with challenges to this reality daily, aren't we? Challenges within ourselves from our human sinfulness, our tendency to, to be selfish and put ourselves first, and challenges without as well. And particularly when hard times come, we face the challenge that it doesn't seem right to put God first. It, seems, it just seems more rational to us, more in line with our basic instinct to put ourselves first. But the good news is, is that God is there with us in these hard times. And he will do whatever it takes to ensure that we not only put him first in our life for his people, but we can, he'll bring us through no matter what the circumstance that we face. Come back to verse 9 and 11 with me. The Lord says, You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? declares the Lord Almighty. Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything the ground produces, on people and on livestock, and all the labor of your hands. Did you notice that? Suffering and the hard times isn't just the context that leads them to put themselves first and neglect God, but actually because they were putting themselves first, the Lord himself caused the drought. He brought the suffering. See, God, in his kindness, will do whatever it takes to give us a wake-up call, to stop us from living in the delusion for ourselves and to see that that's a dead end and to come back to him even in suffering. The great author C.S. Lewis in his book, The Problem of Pain, put it like this. We can ignore even pleasure, but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. See, God is a loving father who brings hardships in our life, not because he wants to inflict pain, but for our good. Uh, this week, we took our son, Jonathan, who's three months old today. We took him to a, a tongue tie clinic and because he, he had a serious tongue tie, which was impeding him feeding properly and it was causing Sam a life pain when she was feeding. So they took him to a specialist and the specialist said, yes, it would be really beneficial for him to have his tongue you know, snipped and, and so he can feed more freely. Um, and of course, we knew what was, he was in store for, and he didn't enjoy being held down by the nurses and the doctor, and then he didn't enjoy when the, the scissors came into his tongue and he's screaming his head off, and then the snip comes and there's blood, he's crying. He had no idea what was going on. We didn't want to inflict this pain on him, but it was for his good, because we loved him. And, and still do love him. <laughs> and... and, and and, you know, you, you'll be pleased to know that five minutes later he was happy and, and you know, once he had some milk and, and he, was, he was good and he's doing great now. But you see, God allows suffering to come to, his, to the lives of his people for our good too. Naturally, we're repulsed by it. We can't see any good in suffering ourselves, particularly in the moment. It goes our most against our most primitive instinct of self-preservation. We can't see how this could be possibly helpful for us. We need God's word to show us. We need God to tell us and comfort us. And that's exactly what he's done. He sent his prophet Haggai, and through exposing and rebuking the people of Israel for their sin, for living for themselves, and even pointing out that the disasters that have happened have been brought by God to wake them up for their good. It's in this context, based on this revelation from God, that his people in verse 12 
obey the voice of the Lord, and they turn back their hearts to him in fear, in reverent fear. And it's important to note that it's in this moment, as they've come back to him, that those precious, beautiful words in verse 13 come. Take a look at them with me. I am with you, declares the Lord. God is saying to them, though I'm causing you pain, I'm not doing this because I'm against you. I'm with you. No matter what is happening in your life, I'm here for you to save you, to rescue you. I love you. Come to me and find hope and life and peace. Turn back your heart to me. I am with you, declares the Lord. See, in suffering, we can fully trust God. We can take the step of faith that puts aside our instinct of self-preservation, no matter how crazy it seems, because we know God is with us. I've got another um, parenting story with Jonathan. You know, he's paying off two illustrations already. Um, <laughs> um, two weeks ago, we tried some sleep training with Johnny. Um, you know, that's a bit of a controversial topic. If you don't know what sleep training is, it's, it's uh, the tactic, the strategy to help a baby learn to sell themselves to go to sleep in bed. They're not um, good at it naturally. And so you put them in their cot, um, you leave them awake, put them in the cot awake, you leave them to bed. It usually involves crying and protesting. And then you come, come in, you know, comfort them and, and say, it's okay. Then you put them back down and, and, keep, and keep doing that until they just learn, it's okay to fall asleep by myself. Sounds pretty simple, right? But after you've spent, you know, two days and he's just been crying for an hour straight, screaming his head off, and you go and hold him, he's shaking, looking at you, distressed, like, what are you doing to me? And he's like, man, is this, how could this possibly be for his good? And then particularly, as, I was, as we were doing that, I was looking, doing you know, some more research, looking at the opposing views and just even doubting the whole validity, validity of the thing. Is this even helpful for him? Is this just outdated? And then eventually the combination of just seeing the stress that I was under and he was under and Sam, um, and, and then just doubting the whole um, goodness of this um, uh, sleep training led me just, we've got, we got to call it off. And so I ran upstairs, picked him from the cot, grabbed him and just burst into tears because I just loved him so much. I didn't want to inflict this suffering on him. Now I'll tell you that story because with God and the suffering he brings onto our lives for our good, we can have no doubts about two things. Firstly, we can have no doubts that God actually knows what he's doing. We can have no doubts that the suffering and the hardships that God brings to our lives are actually for our good. We can be absolutely confident because God is the all-wise, all-loving creator who loves us and cared for, cares for us that the suffering and the timing and the hardship, no matter how extreme it seems to us in the moment, is actually for our good. And secondly, we can have no doubts that he, does, that he does this with a heart of compassion and love that says, I'm with you. I'm with you through this. And do you know why we can have absolutely no doubts? Well, because he's been through it himself. See, the Son of God became flesh, became the Lord Jesus. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, as he was facing the horror of the cross to come, knowing where his father had called him to go to, the, the pain and infliction and the, facing the, the deadly and horrible judgment and the wrath of God. In the garden, the Lord Jesus, with agonized prayers and streaming tears, overcame his temptation for self-preservation. And he said, your will be done. And so he willingly, even joyfully, put his father's will first. He went to the cross and he died. And it was at the cross that the Lord Jesus died and then three days later rose again to offer us forgiveness and new life and to offer, offer us by faith in him and the gift of the Holy Spirit, the power and the ability to live fully for God, to put God front and center in all, all our lives so we can have absolutely no doubt in our times of suffering, that God is with us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God is with you if you trust in the Lord Jesus. And we can say with the Apostle Paul in Philippians 2, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. God, front and center, no matter what, 
the Jesus center of our very lives. I just want to close by reflecting upon a type of building called a mausoleum. Those look like very pretty buildings, but um, look like royal palaces that you might want to live in. But actually, they're just very, very fancy graves. They're big tombs. Now, in life, you have a choice, right? What you build your life around. You can build it around yourself. You can build even an impressive life for yourself. But I just want to say that if you do that, you're just building yourself an impressive morsel lamb. Everything in ourselves and everything without ourselves is calling you to do what's best for yourself, to put yourself first, especially in suffering our instinct of self-preservation misfires and we believe the lies and we seek to preserve ourselves and we turn away from the one who can truly preserve our life, the Lord Jesus. A few years ago, my wife Sammy wrote a poem called Morsel Lamb and I just want to read a part of it to finish. Satan has ensnared this world in a deadly lie. Be who you want. You can have it all. If it doesn't make you happy, it's not worth your time. It's not authentic. You can get what you want. You deserve it. Everything. How easy it is to build for yourself a tomb, an impressive mausoleum, desiring and toiling, and making your whole life about building up, decorating your doomed end. Friends, I just want to plead for us. Don't build your life around yourself. Don't build yourself a morsel in. Run to Christ. Give yourself to him. Build your life on God. Because there and only there can you truly find safety, protection, eternal life, and happiness and peace with him. Truly preserve your life and give yourself to God. It is always the right time to put God front and center. Let me pray. Father, we are so sorry that we are under the delusion that putting ourselves first is ever the right thing to do and to cast you out. We are so sorry for our sin, the way that we do this daily, and we are so thankful that you've given us through the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus forgiveness and the ability to live for you by the power of your Spirit. Please, Lord, cause us to live fully for you no matter what happens, and we thank you that You are there for us in all the suffering and the hardships we face. In Jesus' name, amen.